Live stream audio test, one, two.
good morning, everyone. It's now 10 o'clock and uh, time for me to uh, formally open the inquiry. Can everyone hear what I'm, what I'm saying? It, it, it feels as though you, you might be able to. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's, there's two clocks in the room. They're slightly uh, varied. And then I've got one on my computer that is sort of in between the two. So for a couple of minutes out with my timings, I'm going to follow this one on, the, on, the, uh, on, my, on my computer. Um, so my, my name is uh, Luke Fleming, and I'm the inspector appointed by the Secretary of State to conduct this inquiry. The appeal is that um, made by Beechcroft Land Limited under the provisions of Section 78 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. It is against the, a failure of North Summit, Somerset Council to give notice within the prescribed period of a decision on an application for planning permission. The proposal is described as outline application for the erection of up to 62 dwellings, 30% affordable housing, alongside a new access, landscaping and other associated works, with all matters reserved for future approval apart from access land to the east of Church Lane and north of Front, of Front Street Churchill. To reiterate, it's an outline uh, application with approval being sought for detailed matters only relating to the access only. So all of the matters apart from the access are reserved. Okay. In a moment, I'll need to take details of uh, all those that wish to speak. Uh, then I'm going to set out some administrative matters before saying a few words about the procedure and the inquiry programme. Can I remind everyone to ensure that devices are silenced whilst the inquiry is in session? Uh, the toilets uh, just outside the door on the left-hand side. Um, I'm not expecting any fire drills today, um, but if, if there are any, can a member from the council team just tell us what we, what we should do? You go either out of that door or out the main entrance, and then what you want to do is follow the road to where you parked your car. For everybody else, that's to the right of the town hall door as you come out of it. Uh, take yourself to the car park, stand there, and you'll all be counted, and um, we'll be told whether the building's burning down or not in reality. There are no fire alarms today. Yeah. So if uh, you hear the alarm, it's probably for real. So over the course of the inquiry, will there be any tests that I should be aware of? Well, there isn't one today, sir, and if there's going to be a test, I'll let you know on the morning of the uh, occasion it's going to take place. Thank you. Okay, so that's, that's clear then. Um, the, I'm told the inquiry is being live streamed over the internet. Is that, is that the case? Yep. Um, are we able to check whether that's now started and working yeah, fine. it's working is it fantastic okay so there's a microphone loop um, I'm told that simply press the the button in the uh, center of the microphone and it will light up red that yours is active um, and you will need to do that and make sure you do that for the live stream to to pick it up okay I'm sure we'll have fun with the microphone loop over the course of the two weeks. It's inevitable, um, but, uh, but just, just try and all endeavor to press the button um, and remind anybody that's not done so, so it's picked up over the live stream. Uh, is anybody else here intending to record the event? No? Any members of the press present today? No? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to now take the names of those that, that wish to speak, and I'm going to start with the, the main parties. So, first of all, uh, the, the appellant, Mr. Garvey, can you introduce yourself and your, your team, please? Good morning, sir. My name is Killian Garvey. I'm a barrister um, from King's Chambers. I'm instructed by Mr. Guy Wakefield, who sits to my left, who also happens to be my planning witness. At the end of the front table, 
we've got my uh, witness on character and appearance, uh, Mr. Andrew Cook from Pegasus. Sitting behind him is my heritage witness, Mr. Robert Sutton. Um, next to him is the client who might, um, Mr. Ian Thomas, who might um, come in when we discuss conditions in Section 106 agreement. And finally, um, my ecology witness sits behind me, the aptly named Dominic Farmer. Thank you. And then for the council, Mr. Leader. Yes, good morning, sir. Um, I appear for the council. My name is Timothy Leader, L-E-A-D-E-R. I'm council instructed by Richard Kent, who is head of planning at North Somerset Council. And as you know, sir, I'll be calling four witnesses. The first is John Etchells, who will deal with landscape. The second is Dr. Kate Hudson McCauley, who will deal with heritage matters. The third is Natalie Richards, who will deal with housing, land supply. And finally, Andrew Stevenson deals with the issue of planning policy, compliance or not with the development plan, and the planning balance. So I should say I've also got Mr. Neil Tiley, my five-year supply witness, but he's not in the room today. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd also need to take the names of anyone else who wishes to speak. Um, is anybody here to speak? Yeah, okay, just bear with me a moment. I'm just going to say a few words and then, then I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll come back to you, okay? So I aim to, to hear from you, um, if that's okay, about after 11, after a short mid-morning break, after we've heard the opening submissions from both, both parties. Um, if you do speak, um, I'd like you to come and sit on, on, on the witness table, just so... Um, which, is, which is that one there, okay? Um, just so you've got space to spread out your papers and the parties can, can sort of see you and I can see you as well properly. You're a bit tucked away in that, in that corner. Um, I understand you're probably be speaking in, in opposition to the proposal and with that in mind, um, it would be open to the uh, appellants team to ask any questions of the evidence that you give as well. So just bear that in mind. I also um, might have some questions as, as, as well. So um, it's nothing to worry about, but you should bear that in mind. You should be, you, you should be willing to, to answer questions on, on what you say. Okay. All right then, so if I come to um, the gentleman first. Can you give me your 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 full name, please? If you press your. The... Am I now audible? Yes. yes. My name is Robin Jaycock. J e a c o c k e, sir. Yep. And I'm here to represent Churchill Parish and Churchill Parish Council. Are there any uh, relevant qualifications that you want me to be aware of? Um, well, I I'm a scientist by training, um, and I have a broad interest in um, the local matters for ranging from the natural environment through to our historic heritage. I, I believe, sir, you will you'll probably re reunite me now with uh, written uh, observations I have already placed yeah, with I've, you. I've got so those, I've, I've read those. Okay, fine. so you've listed some qualifications on there. So Indeed. I'll sort of have regard to, to those then, then, sir. Okay. Just to clarify, you are, you are objecting to the scheme? That is correct, sir. Okay. And you're happy to, to answer questions? Certainly. Okay. 
All right, so if it's okay with, with you, we'll hear from you first then after the mid-morning break, um, Mr. Jaycock. Uh, is, it, is it Dr. Jaycock or Mr. Jaycock? Um, Dr. Jaycock. Dr. Jaycock. Uh, we'll, we'll hear from you first after the mid-morning break. Okay, and, it, and just be ready at the, at the, at the table, ready to, to give your, your evidence. Certainly, sir. Thank you. And now I'll, I'll come to the lady to the side of you now, please. Hello. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. My name is Mrs. Jan Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y. Are you, are you a councillor? I am a parish councillor, and I also um, am a member of Churchill and Langford Residents Action Group. So a parish councillor? I am. Okay, and you're speaking as a parish councillor or a resident? I am speaking as a parish councillor. Okay. So just not to labour the point, so you're not, you're not a councillor for North Somerset no, Council? No, right, okay, I am just... Ch Churchill Parish Council and I speak on behalf of them, they know what I'm going to okay, say. Okay, I just want to be certain, is mate. I'm not, thank you. Okay, so just to clarify, you're, are you objecting to the scheme? Yes, I am, sir. Okay, are there any qualifications that you want me to be aware of? Nothing that's relevant, sadly. I'm a nurse, or was a nurse, and, okay. a, and an investigator of social care complaints, okay. but that's, that's okay. not relevant. Okay. Are you, uh, are you happy to answer questions based on the evidence that you give? Well, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. I would be nervous, but I will certainly do my best. So. Okay. All right. So, um, when, when any questions are finished with Dr. Jacob, he'll leave the witness table, just literally follow on and and take your space and, and, and we'll, we'll hear, from, hear from you in the same, same way, yeah. okay? Thank you. Happy, happy with that? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, so I've also had a um, correspondence from a doctor, Simon Clausen, um, a GP, interested party GP, um, can't attend today. Um, but wishes to attend on Friday um, to give some comments. So just, I just flagged that up with, with, with both sides. Um, uh, I've agreed to hear from him in the same way um, after my opening remarks on Friday this week. Okay? All right. And, and obviously, if anybody else attends over the course of the two weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll try and fit them in accordingly. Okay, so is, is an attendance sheet circulating? Okay, can I ask somebody? It is, uh, yes, it's here. And yeah. um, I don't know whether it's been around the other side of the room yet. Are, are you, are you gonna, I was going to ask for somebody to take responsibility for it each day. Is that? That's Mrs. Richardson. She's very good at that. Fantastic. All right, so I'll need one of those to be handed in to me at the, at the adjournment at the end of each day. Thank you, and just make sure that everybody has signed that, please. Um, so just to clarify, because you've said that you wish to speak, your name will appear in my decision at the end. Are you happy with, okay with that? Yep, okay. Um, When I've reached my decision, a copy will be sent to the appellant and the council. Um, it will be available to view on the relevant government website and the council's website as well fairly soon after. Um, right, the notifications, uh, I'm not going to labour on them. I've been through the files. I'm satisfied that I've got all the correct uh, notifications for the uh, inquiry, the planning applications and uh, the planning application and the appeal. Um, people are here, which is always a, a, good, a good sign. Um, the um, uh, planning obligations, I've received a, a draft uh, planning agreement for the scheme. The agreement would secure affordable housing, 
sustainable travel contributions, provision of on-site open space and contributions towards supervision and inspection of that space, contributions to maintenance of fire hydrants. So that agreement, it's fairly usual, is, is at the moment unsigned and, and un, undated. Just to clarify, how soon would, would it be likely that, that a completed agreement would be submitted to the inquiry? So on that, my understanding is that the Section 106 agreement that's been submitted is agreed between the two parties. It's just subject to whatever comments you might have, so um, that's the reason why we haven't signed it. So if there are revisions in light of any observations you make, we can go about and do that. I think we've provisioned that for two weeks from the end. The council is sealing this Thursday. Right. That's, that's the intention, sir, of sealing oh. this Thursday. Um, but obviously, if you have comments and we need to make amendments, then we'll do that at a different time. Yeah, I mean, two weeks is, two weeks is fine by me, it's usual. So again, when towards, towards the end of the inquiry, and it's without prejudice to the outcome of the decision, um, I will lead a round table discussion on the planning obligations. Um, again, interested parties, you're welcome to, to be here and, and participate in that. Um, coming out of it, it may be that, that some of the detail in the obligation may, may change. Um, I don't know. I've, I've read it. Um, I need to think on it and, and reflect on what, what I hear over the course of, uh, course of the inquiry. So um, I suppose we won't know until we have that discussion. Okay. Um, I've received two signed and dated statements of common ground. Uh, one on housing land supply, dated 17th of May. Uh, the other dealing with all other matters, and it's dated the 18th of May. Are they the latest? The latest ones? Yes, sir. Yep. Um, the plans. Again, without prejudice to the outcome of the appeal, uh, it will need to be agreed which plans should be approved if planning permission were to be granted. Um, I'm not going to labour on these. Um, it's an outline scheme, so there are three plans that are specified on, in paragraph 3.6 of the main statement of, plan, of common ground, and these are included as core documents H1 to 3. Yep, so I've had a look at those. Um, we're all in agreement that, that those would be the plans which, which I would be approving should I be minded to grant planning permission, okay? Yep, so all the other plans, and there are many, um, shall be regarded as indicative only um, at this stage. Um, as, as I said before, it's an outline um, proposal with only matters relating to access being approved. Um, I just flag up now, um, we don't need to labour on it, um, those drawings should be the drawings that are specified in the conditions. I think there's a slight variation for the reference number for one of, of those drawings that will need to be looked at in the schedule of conditions. Um, maybe other things that we will, we will pick up on over the course of the inquiry as well. Um, but just to make sure that it's those documents, core documents, H to H1 to H3, that will be need to be specified in the in the conditions, and just check the check the reference numbers. Um, so again, conditions without prejudice to the outcome of the appeal. I've received uh, a schedule of conditions that I believe have been well. I know that they've been discussed by both sides. Um, some are agreed and there's an alternative conditions that have been proposed by the appellant. Uh, again, towards the end of the inquiry, I will chair a round table discussion on the conditions, uh, which again will be without prejudice to the outcome of the appeal, but I need to be certain of what conditions should be imposed should I be minded to grant planning permission. Again, interested parties are welcome to attend that session. Um, it might be helpful for me to say um, we'll be looking at 
doing that, if, if the programme goes to schedule, which it doesn't always, we'd be looking at doing that on Wednesday, the 15th of, of June, the obligations and the conditions. Okay. Um, so late evidence, uh, new, own, new evidence can only be accepted under exceptional circumstances at this stage. I should have, have everything that I need. Um, you'll be aware that the late submission of evidence can be ground for awarding costs. Um, I'm therefore not in, inviting or in, expecting any additional evidence unless it's completely necessary um, for, for the substance of, of the appeal. But if anyone um, intends uh, to submit any, please tell me now. Uh, sir, I've got one or two documents I'd like you to consider, please. Um, and if I tell you what they are, I can tell you that I've spoken to my own friend about them, uh, and we'll see whether they're agreed or not. Sir, you will have noticed in the core documents there were a number of appeal decisions uh, referred to uh, relating to sites in Churchill, mainly along Front Street. And I thought it might be helpful to provide you with a plan indicating which land each relates to. So the first document I'd like to put in is a plan which tells you where decisions uh, which are recorded in the core documents is G11 through to G15 what land is affected by those decisions. That's document number one. Right, well, are you happy with that? I think that would be very helpful to me, so we'll accept that Thank straight you, away. Uh, document number two um, is a copy of the Churchill and Langford Parish Landscape Sensitivity Study. It may be, sir, you tell me you've got a copy of that document. You'll have seen it referred to uh, by Mr. Etchells, but when I looked in the core documents uh, to identify it and be able to read it, I couldn't see it. So I have a copy which I'd like to give you. Um, I don't know whether a load of friends got a copy. If he hasn't, I can supply him with one too. Uh, I don't have a copy. I, I need to take it back to the document. Yeah, well, you should be because Mr. Etchells refers to it in his evidence. Uh, I'm aware that it wasn't explained to me outside the No, 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 that's, that's, that's fair enough. It is in Mr. Reshwell's evidence, so you may find it helpful to have it in front of you mm -hmm. in view of the fact that Mr. Reshwell is going to talk mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that one to aside. Maybe we'll you, so. you could have a talk about that yeah, over yeah, the morning, sure. morning break. Yeah, I, I mean, I assume Mr. Cook read it. Um, mm -hmm. The next uh, document, so the final document, um, is a comparison of the land supply position advanced at recent inquiries. You'll have read Mr. Tarley's evidence, sir. And you'll have noted that what he has done in preparing his evidence is read the proofs of evidence prepared by the Housing Land Supply Witnesses uh, in relation to appeals at Moore Road, Rectory Farm and Farley Fields. Now, sir, um, in view of the appellant's preference to cross-examine on this topic, what I thought would be helpful is to produce a table which summarises by... Uh, category of site, the supply of land that is said to be capable of being demonstrated by this council and each of the appellants and Mr. Tyler, you put them together and what you're able to detect is the areas where there's a difference between the parties and it rather speeds up any uh, examination of Mr. Tyler, however that might take place. Because instead of having to get him to write things down and find things in documents that he's referred to, I could just show him a table. So, sir, if I show you that document, um, I think you will find it helpful. It's what I've mentioned to my own friend. Um, and as I say, Mr. Tyler refers to all of these documents. All I've done is ask Ms. Richards to summarise the key statistics. Mr. Garvey, have you, have you seen that document? Uh, I've seen it I haven't had an opportunity to discuss it with Mr. Tyler. Um, I, and I'd just ask for that opportunity, sir, um, to show it to him. He can verify whether it's... Yeah, it's well, we're not, we're not dealing with that issue no. until next week, no. so, so maybe... I'd it up, sir, yeah. and, uh, as I say, I shall put those statistics to Mr Tiley, come what may. Yeah. Um, 
whether my learned uh, friend I, wants to avail himself to the table or not. So those, those figures are going to come out one way or another. Yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe if you could have a chat over lunch or yeah. if, if you can't reach a conclusion today, maybe we can reach a conclusion tomorrow. But yes, there's a I think what, what I would say is um, I think the more common ground that can be reached on the matter is going to help me. Uh, and if that assists the process, then, you know, it should be, should be welcomed. Of, of course, of course. All right, so we'll, the, 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 the second and third of those documents I'll refrain from yes. sort of accepting at the moment, but if you can sort of have a discussion over the course of this week and, and, and update me as we go. Well, with this um, observation, so of course we're going to hear from Mr. Etchells later on today. Yeah. I hope we are. And he will be speaking to the yep. Parish Council's landscape document. Yeah. So, so I as, I, as I said, if you can think about that over the, the morning break, um, that second one, and then the, the third one, we've got a bit longer to, to converse with you. It would be mildly you. surprising if Mr. Cook hasn't read it. Yeah. So I'll hand you in the plan of the yep. appeal sites, so and then we'll see okay. where we go on the okay. parish council's document. Oh, thank you very much. Without my glasses, I um, missed that one. So yes. So there's four. There's a fourth document. I'm so sorry. And um, the fourth document is a table prepared by Mr. Etchells, which compares various key uh, conclusions by various landscape consultants, be they the parish council, Ward Armstrong himself or Mr. Cook, as to the uh, sensitivity and other measures of uh, landscape and visual impact of the scheme. So, so that summary document does, I think, provide you at a glance uh, a clear impression of the differences between the parties and that's, that summary document sort of something I'd like to put in. Mr. Eshels will then speak to it mm. when he gives his evidence. So there, there's a table that, that relates to the landscape evidence, Indeed, a single so. sheet of paper. It's a, it's a summary it? comparison of different experts' positions. Yeah, okay. Well, that's obviously um, today. So have you, have you considered it? I've got it today. I don't see it as a problem. All right, so we can, if you're happy and if you think it will help, Right, so I'm happy to accept the document number four. So, sir, I will label, how will you label well, the document? Well, we'll get, I was going to get to that, um, because there's been quite a bit that's come in um, in the lead-up to the inquiry as well. Um, yeah, 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 so just those two, please. Thank you. All right. Um, so it may be that other documents emerge over the, the course of the inquiry. Um, right, OK, yep. Sorry. Yeah, um, this is a document that uh, was sent to the planning inspector yesterday, sir, so you might have seen it, but the response was that you, you, as you were traveling, you might not have received it. What it is, is it's a response from comments made by Dr. Jacob uh, Jaycock, which I don't believe is the gentleman at the back. Um, it's, it's a response to a, a late submission from third parties uh, in respect to drainage matters, sir. Right, okay. Sorry, that... But what, what was the comment about Dr. Um, I understood, sorry, that the gentleman at the back is Dr. Robin Jacock. Yeah. And we are responding to Dr. Jacob Jacock, um, who I, I, I think is a different Mr. Person. Jacob, sir, can you clarify? I hope so, sir. Uh, I am Robin Jacock. Uh, something has happened to my Christian name on the way, um, but I do indeed uh, answer to the document you have in front of you, sir. Right. And furthermore, I have uh, a response which I would happily offer now 
It's in hard copy form, but it's also been submitted, as I understand, via the, inspe the planning inspectorate. Whether uh, the inspector has a copy of it is yeah. another matter. All right. I've received that. Thank you, sir. I've not received your response. No, and, I um, I that. can't imagine that anybody else has received that at the moment. Right. Um, what I'd suggest is I'd, I would expect that you're going to say very much of that when you, you sit at the table. Is that fair? Well, I, I was attempting, sir, to try and make it brief. Yeah. <laughs> Consequently, I was hoping that I would be able to answer questions offered to me yeah. and then refer to the documentation, yeah. uh, if that makes sense. So how, how big is your document? Oh, um, the, the response is um, one page. Oh, I beg your pardon, two pages, sir. Do you think it would assist you to, to have that? It, it would do, sir. Um, just so you know, my practice with third parties, I don't tend to cross-examine third yes. parties. I only ask points of clarity, and I yeah. pick it up with professional witnesses. Yeah. That's up to you. Um, so, but yes, it would be helpful, and I obviously don't have a flood risk expert with me today, but mm -hmm. if there is anything, we can get something to Yeah, you. okay. So, um, do you have copies? I have, sir. Would it help if I supplied them to everyone, including yeah. you now? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, what, I'm, what would help me if somebody, over the course of the inquiry, were to keep a list of um, inquiry documents that were sub, that were submitted? Yeah. It does usually fall to the appellant team. So. Um, so notwithstanding those two that we're going to consider, um, but the ones that, that have just been handed to me should be included on that, on that list. Um, but also um, all of the documents that have been submitted in the lead up to the inquiry. Thank you. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to read out a long list just for clarity of what, what I've got. I'm sorry about that but it's just going to be clear to, to what, I, what, I've, what I've got and what should be on that list, okay? I'm going to go quite fast because you know what they all are anyway, okay? So a biodiversity impact assessment, May 2022, uh, and an Excel spreadsheet showing the biodiversity metric calculation. Um, document titled Evidence of Mr. Robin Edward Jaycock, uh, May 22 document titled Evidence of Dr. Robin Jacob, Parish Councillor on behalf of Churchill Parish Council concerning the Barrowfield application, May 22. Uh, summary of appeal decisions. Rebuttal proof of evidence on housing need and supply matters by Mr. Neil Tiley, May 22. Rebuttal landscape proof of evidence by Andrew Cook, 24th of May. <clears throat> Planning obligation compliance statement, 24th of May. Council and appellant suggested conditions. Appeal decision, reference 3285343, dated 27th of April, 22, land at Moor Road, Yatton. Response from Clive Onion to comments made by Dr. Jacob, date 6 of June 22, dealing with flooding and drainage matters. An itinerary map and a map showing locations from which both parties would like me to view the site from. Um, a rebuttal statement on highway and traffic matters to Dr. Robin E. Jacob by Andrew J. Kenyon. An amended indicative site layout plan titled Sketch Layout, and that's included as core document I1. Um, a shadow habitats regulations assessment from Ecology Solutions, dated May 2022. Anything obvious? missing from that list that I should have received? No? Okay. Yeah, double check. Okay, so... 
Uh, excuse me, sir, but uh, we believe there should also be added to that list a document submitted on behalf of the parish council. Um, I'm not sure of the date, sir. It's to the, yeah, are we? It was objecting to the original. It was objecting to the original um, application, um, sir, yeah. and, but it was quite a comprehensive document of yeah. 10 pages. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was, so it was submitted in response to the original application. It was okay, indeed. So yeah, I've got that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So if, if the appellants can maintain that list of, of inquiry documents and if anything else materializes, just add it to the list and then hopefully we'll be able to hand that up to me at the, at the close of the inquiry. Thank you, that would, that's going to help me a lot. Um, okay, so moving on um, to procedures in the programme. Although we started at 10 today, we're going to start at 9.30 uh, on subsequent days, and we're going to aim to finish no later than 5.30 each day. I'm going to aim for an hour's lunch and mid-morning and afternoon breaks. Um, if you're giving evidence after a break, please be seated, ready to give the evidence. It will assist the speed of the inquiry. Um, the inquiry is being uh, held under 2000 inquiry procedure rules, but following the recommendations made in the Rosewell Review of uh, Inquiry Procedure. And the format will be mixed. It's mainly a combination of evidence in chief, followed by roundtable discussions, which will be led by me. Um, but the majority of the evidence is going to be evidence in chief. Um, I'm going to hear opening statements from the appellant uh, first and then the council and then towards the end I'll hear closing submissions and there'll be opportunities for, for costs. Um, so I've spoke about the running order for today. Um, I'm going to hear the opening submissions. We're going to have a short break and then I'm going to hear from the interested parties at the witness table. Okay, then we're going to break for lunch and I'm going to hear the, uh, the council's uh, landscape evidence and that will take us through to today's conclusion where I'll adjourn till tomorrow. The rest of the week is set out on an inquiry program. There should be copies in the room. Um, so, um, uh, uh, in, uh, can you pass those to the people at the back to just have a look at if there are, just so they can see what's happening for, for the rest of, of the week? in the following week. So that, that may change, but that's what, that's what we're, we're aiming for, okay? I'm not gonna read all that out, but, but that's, that's, that's what, what, the, what we'll be aiming to do over the two weeks. Um, okay. Just clarify your practice. Um, some inspectors um, proceed on the basis that when they've set out a draft timetable, if you're running ahead of schedule, um, that doesn't mean you start to plug things in early. So for example, if I was anticipating beginning the cross-examination on Wednesday morning, but it just so happened that by two o'clock this afternoon, we might have started that cross-examination, would you A, plow on, or B, say, right, we'll adjourn off and hear this evidence tomorrow? No, I, I think, I think for this one, there's a lot of interested parties and there are not many here today. Um, the only change to the schedule is if, will be if things take longer than expected, I won't be plugging gaps. It'll be, it'll be as, in, I'll be aiming, the optimum solution will be as indicated. Um, okay, so, okay. All right, so. I'm not going to talk at length about what's expected when you're giving evidence on the witness stand. I think most people are fairly experienced with that, but please do answer questions directly. If you can answer with a yes or no, that might suffice. Um, but we'll be looking for questions to be answered. And when you, you are giving evidence, I may also have some questions as well. But don't try and sort of avoid the question because experience shows that it's very, very rarely successful. It's better to sort of answer the question, even if you don't like the answer. Um, so I'm not going to labor on that. Um, 
Okay. Um, costs, there are no applications for awards of costs. Does that remain the case? I, I don't have instructions to make an application at this time, sir. As, as of today, there is no application. Okay. Okay. Uh, the site visit, I've been to site. Um, I've walked um, a lot of the footpaths. I was there about an hour and a half yesterday in the sunshine. Um, so yeah, I've got a, I'm familiar with the area, uh, obviously not as well as, 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 as local people, but I've got a good understanding of, of the main features of the area, the conservation area, the listed building, um, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, so bear that in mind, but I'll be making another visit towards the, uh, the end of the inquiry. Um, I'll also, what I'll probably do, um, time permitting, I'll, um, there's a break in the inquiry on Wednesday this week, so I think what I'll do on that day is visit to observe traffic um, in the morning and in the evening um, at, 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 at the appropriate times. But I'll be doing that un unaccompanied. Um, you know, I'm... I can't discuss anything on site, but I, I will do that just just so I can observe the sort of peak traffic period because I know that's a concern of of interested parties. I think that's Thursday. So Th sorry, Thursday. Yeah. I'll be doing that on Thursday. Thank you. I'm getting ahead of myself for a site visit, so that would be Thursday. Okay. All right. So main issues um, are. The effect of the proposal on the character and appearance of the area, the landscape, the Churchill Conservation Area, and the Grade 1 listed St John's Church. Two, whether the council can demonstrate a five-year supply of housing land and the extent of any shortfall. Three, whether the site would be a sustainable location for the proposed development, having regard to the development plan and national policies. The wording is not final. It may change to better reflect the nature of our discussion and my report writing um, after the inquiry is closed, but those are the, the, the main issues as I see them. Um, there may be other matters that you feel are important and providing they relate to the planning merits of the case, there's no reason why they shouldn't be raised. I'm mindful of the other local concerns, in fact of the proposal on infrastructure and, and, and ecology, and I'd like the appellant's advocate to take these up at the, the relevant witnesses during the evidence in chief. Um, so everyone satisfied that they're the main issues? Yep. Yep. Okay. So timetabling recap, we're, we're, we're expecting to sit for seven days, although I'd estimate it could be six as set out in my program. We've, I've clearly set out what we're doing today. Um, and the rest of the week will follow that the rest of the two weeks will follow that inquiry program that you should all have sight of. Uh, is a copy of that program on the uh, examination, on, on, the, uh, on the website, on the inquiry website. If you could just put that on for people that might be wanting to tune in for particular issues, I think it would be helpful. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the procedural or the running order? for the inquiry. No. Thanks, sir. No. Okay. So we'll go straight on to, to hear the opening submissions from the uh, from the main parties, starting with the case for the uh, appellants. I've obviously got it in writing, sir, but um, I, I understood the council were printing them.
Um, sir, your post-case management conference notes helpfully summarise the main issues. These opening submissions will address them briefly. Uh, in terms of the effect of the proposal on the character and appearance of the area and the heritage assets, in respect to landscape, there are a number of preliminary points to make. Firstly, it is agreed that there are low, no landscape designations associated with the appeal site, nor is it a valued landscape. Secondly, the impacts associated with the appeal proposal are mostly localised. And thirdly, the Council accept that there will be no harm to residential amenity. The Council assert that there are adverse impacts to the Mendil, Mendip Hills area of outstanding natural beauty. The Council distinguish between views towards the AOMB and views from the AOMB. As regards the views from the AOMB, the Council described the impact as low level. <clears throat> the appellant's case is that there is no appreciable impact on views from the AOMB, given that at most, all that will be perceived is the view of a few rooftops in the context of other existing development from glimpsed and heavily filtered views. As regards the views towards the AOMB, it is common ground that the site is within the setting of the AOMB. However, the setting of the AOMB covers a vast area of several kilometres. The MPPF does not protect the views towards the AOMBs in the same way as it protects views from, from it. Indeed, this was acknowledged in the Stroud judgment, wherein the court held as follows. Um, I will go through this, at least the highlighted sections, because in that judgment, the court, the, the issue was, well, what do we do about views towards the AOMB? And the court said, and this is the highlighted text, but to go so far as to say that it must also cover land from which the AOMB can be seen, and great weight must be given to the conservation of beauty in the AOMB by reference to that impact, reads too much into paragraph 115 of the framework. The inspector noted <clears throat> that almost everywhere in the Stroud district would fall into that category. So we say the same is true here, um, that if you were to afford great weight to any view towards the AOMB, it would be um, extent, overextending the protection the MPPF gives. So, so paragraph nine, we say thus, it is only the views from the AOMB that we need to concern ourselves with in terms of AOMB protection. The appellant accepts that there will be visual harm arising out of the development proposal. Indeed, it is, dis it is difficult to conceive of the development of any greenfield site that would not give rise to such harm. However, the appellant asserts that the council have sought to over-exaggerate these harms. Indeed, the council make much of views across the site from Windmill Hill. However, those views are in close proximity to the site and, critically, are in the context of Churchill. Indeed, users of the public right-of-way would already be seeing residential development in the surrounding area as they walk towards the site from Windmill Hill before they even see the site itself. Thus, the appellant ultimately accepts some harm in respect to these views, but this does not provide a sufficient reason to refuse permission. As regards heritage, the parties are quite some way apart on this matter. The council said that there was harm to the conservation area and the grade one listed church. The appellant says there is no such harm. The council's essential point is that there will be housing in an open field, and this must necessarily harm the conservation area. However, the council do not properly examine what the historical significance of the conservation area is and what contribution the site currently makes toward it. Similarly, the council highlight that there will be some interference with views towards the church. However, these are not historically significant views that impact on the church's significance. However, sir, even if you are more sympathetic to the council's position, ultimately any landscape and heritage harm does not warrant the refusal of planning permission, particularly given the council's dire housing supply position. So moving on to the supply position, it is common ground that the council do not have a five-year housing land supply. However, the extent of the shortfall is not agreed. The council are currently only willing to agree that they lack a supply, but give no indication as to the extent of the shortfall. The appellant, in contrast, says that the council can only demonstrate a 2.95 year supply. The appellant will demonstrate that the council's position on a number of sites lacks credibility and that the position is as poor as the appellant asserts. But the current supply is only half of the story on five year housing land supply. The Court of Appeal in Hallam Land also held that other relevant factors include how long the shortfall has existed and what is being done to remedy the problem. In respect to both points, the council's situation is poor. The council have been unable to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply for the majority of the preceding eight years. 
As a consequence, the Council will not deliver the minimum level of housing identified as being required in the core strategy across the plan period. Further, there is no indication as to when the Council supply issues will be resolved. Their emerging plan is, even on the Council's timetable, not going to be adopted until December 2023, unless the parties agree that it can only be given at the most very limited weight. Further, the Council can demonstrate no housing projection post-2026. Accordingly, the supply has been poor for a significant period of time with no end in sight. For these, the reason for this is, in part, that this is a heavily constrained authority. Indeed, almost half of the district is in the Greenbelt. Further, in the remaining areas, the district has a considerable amount of land in the AOMB and large areas in high-risk flood zones. Indeed, the Council themselves are proposing the release of Greenbelt land under the Exceptional Circumstances Test through the emerging plan to meet their housing needs. The fact that they are resorting to such measures is indicative of the fact that there are insufficient sites without adverse land use impacts. Accordingly, even if the Council are correct as to the adverse land use impacts of the proposal, the fact remains that the Council will inevitably need to develop such sites in order to get their housing supply restored. Further, the Council are failing to deliver sufficient affordable housing. Indeed, in the period 2009 to 2020, 1,272 affordable homes have been delivered as compared to the need identified in the Schmar for 9,944 homes. So whether the site would be in a suitable location for the proposed development, um, the appellant accepts that the development proposal conflicts with the development plan when read as a whole. However, it is common ground that the plan is out of date and thus the appellant's case is that only limited weight should be afforded to this conflict. Given the absence of a five-year housing land supply, the tilted balance is engaged. The council argue, however, that the heritage arm disengages the tilted balance. The appellant obviously asserts that there is no such heritage arm. However, even if the appellant is wrong, we say that the public benefits are such that they would outweigh any less than substantial harm applying paragraph 202 of the framework. So even adopting the council's view, this minor level of harm cannot sensibly provide a clear reason for refusing development that would disengage the tilted balance. The appellant says that in the context of the tilted balance, the alleged harm will not significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits, which are substantial and include um, the provision of market and affordable housing to meet identified needs, economic benefits through to construction period as well as local spend, improvements to local public transport infrastructure, and significant biodiversity improvements through a biodiversity net gain of 44.13%. So overall, sir, we said that the appeal site provides a logical location for development. The detailed work before the inquiry shows that there is no good reason to prevent it coming forward to make a contribution to meeting the area's needs as soon as possible. Subject to the evidence, conditions, and Section 106 obligations, the appellant will therefore request in due course that the appeal be allowed and permission be granted. Those are my submissions, sir, at this stage, unless I can assist you further. Thank you. Mr. Leader. Thank you very much. Um, can I just, um... I was going to ask to take brief instructions on what I've just heard, but I can't because the officer I was going to talk to is out of the room, so I'll just get on with it. Sir, in view of the uh, very considerable difference between the parties in respect of impact on landscape and impact on designated heritage assets, I have set out my opening in a little more detail than I would normally do, but I hope it's going to be helpful. Dealing first with the issue of housing land supply. Housing delivery in North Somerset is improving markedly year on year. In 2021, its housing delivery test was 81%. In 2022, it had improved to 89%. Consequently, it is no longer required to apply a 20% buffer, which signifies significant under-delivery of housing over the previous three years. 
with the object of improving the prospect of achieving the planned supply. So, that does not mean the council is complacent. It is granting more planning permissions throughout North Somerset, including the service villages and Churchill in particular. And I've set out in my footnotes uh, certain details of what we are doing and what we have done in Churchill. However, it still has work to do. And in the light of the recent appeal decision in respect of land at Moor Road in Yatton, it concedes that it is unable to demonstrate that it possesses five years' supply of land for housing. Furthermore, in an effort to avoid unnecessary and wasted expense reviewing contested sites for the fourth time since mid-February, the Council accepts the shortfall is material and that but for the provisions of NPPF footnote 7, the shortfall would engage the tilt and balance of paragraph 11D, thereby rendering the policies which are most important for determining the application out of date. In that context, whether or not the tilted balance is triggered, the delivery of 62 new homes, including a policy compliant contribution of 30% affordable homes, ought to be afforded substantial weight. However, as the appellant well understands, the importance that the government attaches to boosting the supply of new homes is not always a trump card. The object of securing a five-year supply of land for housing and building more homes must be pursued in a manner that achieves sustainable development. That requires developers to advance only those proposals which strike a proper, sensible balance between environmental considerations and the social and economic benefits of new homes. Meeting the needs of the present in a way that compromises the ability of future generations to meet their own needs by promoting unsympathetic development in sensitive places is antithetical to the policy of the MPPF, as is illustrated by the recent decision in respect of Barrowfield on Front Street in Churchill and numerous other decisions in North Somerset, notwithstanding the absence of a five years supply of housing land. Keeping the golden thread of sustainable development clearly in sight, over the course of this inquiry, the Council's evidence will show the following, dealing with landscape impact first. That the appeal site and its immediate surroundings represent a high quality, high value landscape of high sensitivity, which is unable to accommodate the development proposed by the appellant. That would result in a substantial adverse impact on Churchill's landscape viewed as a resource. And the relatively tranquil landscape of the appeal site is also of high visual quality. The pleasant scenic views obtained from paths that run across it and from local roads help to reveal Churchill as a small, historic, rural settlement set in a pastoral landscape. The quality of what people experience on and around the appeal site is enhanced by views of the Grade 1 listed Church of St John the Baptist, vet veteran sycamore and oak trees set within the site, and the opportunity to experience the appearance and character of Churchill Conservation Area, of which the appeal site is a part. The urbanisation of the appeal site would cause substantial harm to the enjoyment of the landscape of the appeal site, especially by those who use public rights of way across and near the site and who travel by car, bicycle, or on foot along adjoining roads. The landscape would cease to provide a high-quality rural environment for those who wish to walk across it. Views of the church would be disrupted and limited. Veteran trees would be divorced from the landscape setting, and their scenic value greatly diminished. The opportunity the site offers to appreciate the church and the conservation area would be harmed, and the historic evolution and form of the village disrupted by infilling an area of countryside that separates the church from what became the historic heart of the village and which gives Churchill an unusual and distinctive quality. Another striking quality of the appeal site which increases its sensitivity to development is the special opportunity it offers to enjoy views of the Mendip area of outstanding natural beauty. The site is part of the setting of the AONB and locally important views of the Mendips can be enjoyed from Windmill Hill across the green apron of the appeal site, across Front Street, which sits at a lower level than the appeal site. Whilst the appellant scheme will not obstruct this view, it would be degraded 
by the urbanisation of the appeal site, which would introduce a swathe of discordant urban development above Front Street, thereby eroding the setting of the AONB. And if I may just insert something there, so it's this. My learned friend referred you to the Stroud judgment in paragraph 115 of the framework. Very interesting. My learned friend might also want to consider, though, in the course of this inquiry, what policy DN11 of the North Somerset Sites and Policies Plan, which you will find at page 30 of divider A2, has to say about views into the AONB, because it doesn't say what the MPPF says, but it is a framework compliant plan, and that policy has never been impugned, as far as I'm aware, at any appeal where it has been engaged. So, what the MPPF says is interesting, what the more specific policy says is even more so, and we'll be looking at that. Reading on at paragraph 5, sir. The harm the development would cause the landscape causes the scheme to conflict with core strategy policies CS5 and CS32 and policies DM10, DM11 and DM32. If I could just pause there, so I referred to CS32. Um, both parties refer to it. The appellant also concedes conflict with CS33. Now, that's probably because when one is really forensic about matters, CS32 uh, may be less apt than CS33, and that's something we're going to have to grapple with as we go through the, po the policies. Um, CS32 relates to land which adjoins the settlement boundary, and I think uh, the appellant's planning witness does concede that, in fact, it doesn't actually and we can see that later on as we go through the evidence. But I just point that out now, sir. There's a, there's a difficulty. Do we use CS32 or CS33? Either way, it doesn't perhaps matter because the appellate concedes there's conflict with both. But continuing. It is important to state here that the council disagrees strongly with Mr Cook's interpretation of what is meant by landscape in policies CS5 and CS32. Four points need to be made. First, his approach, which is to interpret the policies as being concerned solely with landscape character, not visual amenity, is wrong as a matter of construction. Second, it is at odds with the approach adopted by the landscape profession. Third, it has the bizarre result that the Council's policies for ensuring development preserves or enhances North Somerset's landscape have to be applied without regard to how it appears to people the policy serves. Fourth, Mr. Cook's approach is at odds with that taken by inspectors and appellants ever since the policies were adopted. Thus, while Mr. Cook's approach is ingenious, this is also completely wrong. As will be seen, the same may be said about Mr. Cook's assessment of the scheme's landscape impact more generally, which is at odds with that of Wardle Armstrong, a study carried out on behalf of the Parish Council, Mr. Reshall's assessment on behalf of the Council, and in certain respects, assessment made by his own firm and the LVIA submitted with the appellant's planning application. The key point is this, that whereas the severe adverse impact of the scheme on the landscape is relatively localised, its contribution to the appearance, character and setting of designated heritage assets, whose qualities are experienced locally, amplifies the importance of landscape and the weight that should be attached to its harm. So turning next to the impact on designated heritage assets, the site is part of the setting of St. John's Church, it is also part of the setting and in part an integral part of the Churchill Conservation Area. Taking the conservation area first, the part of the appeal site which forms part of that designated heritage asset, a tract known as Barrowfield, is by virtue of section 691 of the planning listed buildings and conservation areas act of 1990 part of an area in north somerset which is of special architectural historic interest the character or appearance of which it is desirable to preserve or enhance further section 72 of the act requires special attention to be paid to the desirability of preserving or enhancing the character and appearance of the conservation area including that part which is part of the appeal site the remainder of the appeal site also affords views into, it gives access to the conservation area, it is thus part of its setting. Now the council will show that the appearance and character of that part of the appeal site which is within the conservation area and that which forms part of its setting imparts significance to it. 
It does so by acting as the backdrop for a diverse range of attractive and historic buildings arranged in a linear pattern along Front Street. It also affords an opportunity to appreciate the significance of the conservation area as a separate and distinct historic phase of the development of Churchill to the east of the earlier nucleus of the village's development around St. John's Church. Now, the introduction of a large modern housing estate with an entirely different grain appearance and layout compared with the conservation area around Front Street would obliterate the rural character and appearance of the part of the site that is situated within the conservation area. It would also compete and jar with the historic character of Front Street in a similar vein, development within the setting of the conservation area would diminish its significance by urbanising its rural setting, which would be especially degraded viewed from public rights of way across the site, Church Lane and Windmills, Windmill Hill. The development of the appeal site would also infill the open space that shapes, preserves and evidences the historic development of the village and the separate evolution of the conservation area. More particularly, the site helps to reveal and allow the appreciation of the historic contraction of the village around St. John's Church and the growth of the later east-west axis along Front Street. That is what gives Churchill's conservation area a distinct and special historic appearance and character, and that special character would obviously be harmed by the appeal proposals. This conclusion will be shown to be consistent with the decisions of inspectors Chandler, Pope and Jones, and on that basis, you will be advised to prefer the evidence of Dr. Hudson McCauley for the Council to that of Mr. Sutton for the appellant. As for the Church of St. John the Baptist, part of the significance of the church is derived from its aesthetic qualities, which give it a distinctive landmark quality, and from its unusual spatial relationship to the core of the village, which evidences its evolution since the Middle Ages. That significance can be appreciated and enjoyed by virtue of the tranquil, attractive, open, rural character of Barrowfield and the direct route across it via public footpath 2910 to and from the church and the villages who have worshipped there for centuries. The council contends that the urbanisation of the church's setting would degrade and reduce the opportunity to appreciate its aesthetic qualities. Mr Sutton appears to agree, it's hard to tell, but if he does, he does so grudgingly. The harm to the church and the conservation area is properly characterised as less substantial, however, as a matter of law and policy. The desirability of preserving and enhancing each asset must be accorded great weight. Harm to the significance of either requires a clear and convincing justification. The council will show there is none. As for the development plan and the planning balance, the appellant concedes that the proposals conflict with the development plan and read as a whole. But this is only necessary to make two short points in opening. First, the extent of that conflict is understated by the appellant's misinterpretation of landscape policies and its failure properly to recognise that harm will be caused to the landscape, including the veteran trees and the setting of the OMB and designated heritage assets. Second, the harm caused to designated heritage assets is not outweighed uh, by the public benefits of the scheme. Therefore, full weight should be given to the conflict with the development plan and commensurate weight should be given to the parallel conflict with the MPPF's policies for the countryside, the landscape and heritage assets. That harm is not outweighed by the provision of market and affordable housing, biodiversity net gain and the other benefits claimed for the scheme. All of those benefits can and should be realised by the development of new homes at an appropriate scale in less sensitive and sustainable locations. Uh, so before I finish, and I'll only be a minute or two longer, um, in opening my learned friend made the point that he said it's agreed that there are no landscape designations associated with the appeal site in order to value landscape. That is true, but if one reads, as we shall do, page 83 of Glivia, we will note First of all, that Glivia talks about the situation where there are no local landscape designations, and in North Somerset there are not. And secondly, um, Glivia then tells you what you should do, which is not to assume the landscape has no value, 
but to value it appropriately. And that is something I shall show Mr. Cook has manifestly failed to do. My learned friend talked about views towards the AOMB. I've dealt with that by talking to you about DM11. Third thing that I thought I heard my learned friend say, but if he didn't, I will apologize and take what I'm about to say back. But I thought my learned friend said, it is a matter of agreement between the parties that the development plan is out of date. Well, it's not. Having just checked the um, statement of common ground, I don't think I have read that anywhere, but if I'm wrong, I'll be corrected. The position is rather that if the tilted balance is engaged, following a proper consideration of the public benefits of the scheme weighed against less substantial harm to conservation interests, well, then the most important policies for the determination of this appeal will be out of date. But there is no concession by the Council that its plan is out of date, just to make that clear. As I say, if I've uh, got that wrong, um, I'll be corrected. So unless I can assist you further, those are my opening submissions. Okay, thank you for those. Um, slightly behind schedule, but we're, we're doing okay, I think. Um, but I think it's time for a short uh, mid-morning break. Um, so 11... Um, 12, if that's okay. Are you okay to break? Yep. Yep. So 11, 12, uh, we'll adjourn and come back at 11.30.
just after 11.30, so the inquiry is resumed. Um, we're now going to hear from the uh, interested parties. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Dr. Jacob, just just before you start, just I've read everything that you've that you've put in, um, so just bear that in mind. There's no need to, to sort of repeat it at, at, at length. Um, are you comfortable? You've got water settled. Is your microphone on? It is now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, again, there's no need to repeat everything, and then obviously, um, when we hear from um, Ms. Murray after, there's also no need to sort of repeat everything that that, um, that Dr. Jacob might have said as well. Um, and I've read everything that you've you've put in as well. Okay, so remember, whatever you say, there may be. Um, questions that are, that are put to you as, as, as well, mm -hmm. but equally I didn't say as well, I may uh, allow you to, to ask questions of the other parties' evidence as well at the appropriate time. Okay, so whenever you're ready, just speak clearly and relax and we'll hear from you. Good morning, uh, Inspector, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robin Jacob and I represent the concerns of a very concerned parish and we are presented with a most unfortunate situation where the current circumstances are placing us in an almost impossible position whereby we have to cope with enormous increases in population and very little increase in the support network, the infrastructure, that is actually required. Now, I want to introduce three particular areas here which the local authority has not um, actually entertained, but which I believe are important in the overall issue, and they have planning significance. But before that, if I may, I wish to try and make a general point about where we are at nationally, and it runs like this. Land is an important and limited resource. I am concerned that what we actually have at present is an insufficient system for dealing with the priorities that must ultimately be assigned to a limited material available to us, the available land. The planning policy framework of, of 2012 set out some admirable objectives. And you will recall that it has three specific areas where those objectives are to be assessed. One is economic, another is social, and yet another is environmental. And I think it would be fair comment from many of us outside that what seems to have happened is that the economic matter has been effectively the only determinant on many occasions. And that the social and the environmental aspects of what was supposed originally to be a tripod those elements have been hacked away very effectively and unfortunately we're now left with a most unfortunate compromise which is really no compromise at all. Now, one of the elements of this um, that affects us in rural environments is this. It's very easy to suppose that land which potentially is available for housing in a rural environment, particularly if it is close to a center of population or not very, very distant, should be deemed a resource to be 
employed for housing uh, activities in the future. Unfortunately, what this does is it places us in a most invidious future position because what we are then doing is to locate a population which is dependent upon a remote center of employment in circumstances where it will have to employ substantial amounts of energy simply in order to undertake its daily commute into the population center, which is rather remote from its place of um, its housing. And this is a rather paradoxical situation, the more so when you consider that we are now placed in a new circumstance where we recognize a climate emergency and the underlying implication of that is that we have to look to reducing, not increasing, our energy expenditure. Well, so much for the general, now for the particular. So I have wished to outline three particular areas where I think we have, at this particular site, some very specific problems. One is hydrological, another is ecological, and the third concerns the sorts of traffic and highways implications of this proposal. Now, as far as hydrology is concerned, what is apparent here is a ra rather remarkable situation peculiar to this locality, to this particular site, and that is a source of water which is very substantial but occurs only rather infrequently. Um, the data that I've offered in detail in my written submission indicates that we are dealing here with a, an intermittent source from underneath Windmill Hill, the capacity of which is capable of sustaining an outflow from Windmill Hill adjacent to the proposed site of the order of 100 liters per second for many days indeed for several weeks. Now, the overall output anticipated for surface water draining rapidly off the site is itself substantially less than that. Indeed, it is explicitly set by a form of turbulence control to very much less than that flow rate. However, the uh, designers of the system at this site have set to themselves an objective which is to cope with flow rates in excess of the design maximum, and they have installed pipework to drain that water away down to a local drainage channel, a natural drainage channel, um, which is capable of sustaining a flow of the order, the same order as this 100 liters per second that I have just mentioned. Unfortunately, the capacity of that pipework is not adequate to sustain the combined flow of both these sources, that is the site and also the output from this resurgence which is known as Bishop's Well. So we have a dilemma. In fact, we have two dilemmas, really, from a, an engineering point of view. Not only is the pipework going to prove inadequate, but also, if you ignore the presence of this resurgence, which is perfectly possible to do, because most of the time it disgorges no water at all, 
then you can readily suppose that what will happen is that the source will be inadvertently blocked. Now, in regard to blockage, we already know that the source that I'm referring to, Bishop's Well, causes substantial flooding on Church Lane, the medieval route that we now have to depend upon um, to take us northwards towards Kongsbury. Furthermore, um, that's because there is a culvert under the road but the culvert under the road, which is intended to accommodate the flow from the bishop's well, is not adequate for this purpose. Now, I'm not suggesting that any of these things make construction of the sort envisaged by the applicants um, a, an impossible feat, far from it. But unless you do actually acknowledge the problem, then you will create a difficulty which is very substantial, and there will be dramatic floods as a consequence. So I'm counseling caution and a, an explicit awareness that this is a problem. I suggest that were it to be ignored, then that would represent a statutory problem because the current legislation does explicitly suggest that you should be aware of local circumstances like that. Now, as far as the ecological matters are concerned, well, there are a number of them, um, and uh, I have chosen simply to um, out, uh, outline two. Um, one element is the um, matter which has already been um, investigated by the ecological consultants um, for the application, uh, the matter of horseshoe bats in particular, but bats in general, because what they have done is to undertake a very detailed survey using um, acoustic methods, uh, which allows one to identify by their acoustic uh, ultrasound signature at least 11 species of the 18 species of bat that inhabit Britain. So what we can also say from this data that the consultants have actually provided is that this is, from the bat's point of view, an important through route and an important foraging region Bats tend, in general, to depend on ultrasound for uh, capturing prey and also uh, for navigation. They also depend on vision, um, and most bats depend upon a hybrid of these two inputs. Now, the the uh, information available to us indicates that amongst the bats that use these routes, there are three or four really rather unusually rare species, and two of those species, the greater and lesser horseshoe bat, are explicitly protected in ways that are substantially greater than the protection afforded to all bats in general. Now, quite apart from the bat problem, there is yet another difficulty, which is that we have another species that is on a highly protected list, which exists in this immediate area, and that is the great crested newt, which has not been um, noted by the, um, uh, the authorities for the uh, application. Um, and it is undoubtedly present around the site and quite possibly on the site, but that we do not know. Certainly, in my garden, there is a pond 
a pond less than 100 meters away from the site boundary or in which great crested newts live during the breeding season and those bats' presence is attested by DNA evidence which was provided by another ecological consultant for another adjacent application. So this place is a statutory requirement um, which will have to be met. Quite what natural England will decide they need to do in this matter is another question, but it is certainly not an issue that can be ignored. Now finally, I come to the highways matter, and I hope um, that I have answered some of the um, questions that were raised in regard to my submission over this. Um, but I would like to thank uh, Mr. Kenyon for his rapid response to my observations. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to debate those in detail with him, but my answer to his overall concern is that is firstly this, that I consider that the traffic data that I have assessed, which is in common with his assessment um, in general, also indicates that we are dealing with a substantially trafficked multi-directional intersection here close to a school. And I would suggest that that itself is a matter that needs serious consideration. Furthermore, I would point out that in my opinion, his assertion that what we're doing is to change a T-junction into an, uh, a, uh, a crossroads but with sufficient offset that the crossroads is not a serious matter, that that is unrealistic, and that the offset which he uh, adduces is insufficient to produce a safety margin that would be generally regarded as realistic. When you have a crossroads and the minor road crossing the major road constitutes a possible danger because people may not notice the major road, then the normal procedure is to offset one road relative to the other minor element by substantially more than one car's length in order to obstruct inadvertent crossing. Whereas here, he rightly asserts that the plans indicate an eight meter offset. I don't think that is adequate. Um, the other matter that um, I would adduce as important in this regard is not the um, highways issue itself, but its implication for other matters. Thus, for instance, what we have to do is to ensure that in any modern housing development, ingress and egress are safe. And this site has two such points of access. One, the one I've just referred to, and another one on Church Lane. In order to ensure that these access roads are sufficiently clear and have adequate visibility, we're going to have to undertake some safety-related changes in the local topography and in the local hedgerows. And in, thereby, what uh, will happen is that the Elements that have both landscape and ecological significance at present, hedgerows that are high and wide, will be effectively removed, effectively obliterated in the interests of visibility and safety. 
Now, that may be a necessary matter if development is to take place, but I suggest it's yet another issue with which we need to take some concern. And so I would suggest that it is another element that should be there in the planning balance. Um, I think at that point I, I will end and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Jaycock. Um, Pellants, do you have any questions for Dr. Jaycock? No, sir. As I indicated, I, I'll pick those up with my witnesses if that's okay, sir. So much of that will be will be covered in the evidence over the course of the next the next um, this week and next. So Indeed, I, I don't have any questions either. For you. Thank you, sir. But thank you, though. Oh, before I leave, would it be sensible if I distributed hard copies of the evidence I have offered um, to uh, everyone now or at lunchtime? Is this, is this the evidence that you've already put in? That's right, yes. So if, we've, if everybody's got it... I imagine that everyone will have it, so yes. it's probably redundant. So, so I think it, we've, yeah. you've done, done all, that, you. all that you can. Thank you. Is, it, is there a clean... Do you, want some water? Do you want some water? I'll try and manage without, thank you. I think some, some may well be on its way anyway. <laughs> right, just get settled and then when you're, when you're ready. I have a hearing issue, so maybe um, it's going to echo. Okay, well, shall we see, see, see how we happens. get on? See what happens. Um, good afternoon, oh, good morning, good morning, I'm sorry. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Mrs. Jan Murray. I'm Churchill Parish Council and um, Churchill and Langford Residence Action Group, um, otherwise known as CalRAG. Um, Churchill Parish Council and CalRAG wholeheartedly supports North Somerset Council's position to refuse permission to, for development on this incredibly important site um, in Churchill Parish and its residents. Um, I refer to Churchill Parish Council's response to this application, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it is incredibly important. It's, it's um, 10 pages, and I believe it was very carefully prepared um, by the council, and um, we hope that, that I, I don't want to repeat anything that's in it. Um, CalRAG is in constant touch with just under a thousand residents and its aims to promote good development and development in the right place. Churchill Parish Council and CalRAG are volunteers drawn from a wide demographic. We do not have the resources to employ barristers to represent us. However, we can but put to you the views and feelings of the overwhelming number of residents with whom we are in touch and give you the evidence from the grassroots experience. Many residents would like to be here to, and speak, but fear simply reiterating what has already been submitted to you or cannot be here due to working, but they are grateful for the live streaming opportunity available in the evenings. Too many of them feel despondent that their views have been continually ignored and they see their village culture suffering at the hands of developers against the might of whom they feel there is little hope. Residents are witnessing serious concerns put to one side, including settlement boundaries, significant environments, the evidenced presence of protected species of bats and great crested newts, as Robin has just alluded, overlooked. Historical grade one and grade two listed buildings, land classified by both North Somerset Council's own and Churchill Parish Council's independently commissioned for our neighborhood plan, 
landscape sensitivity assessments as high sensitivity, which is this site. Protected views from and to the AONB, dark skies, sensitivities, hydrological issues, and even conservation areas seem to count as naught against such powerful forces. I should add here that Churchill's neighborhood plan is in early draft, but the parish council was advised approximately a year ago to put it on hold due to forthcoming new North Somerset local plan, which actually does make sense. In 2018, Professor Paul Cheshire, Professor Emeritus of Economic and Economic Geography at the LSE and an expert in urban and land use economics, was one of the many voices calling that we should protect, be protecting the land that needs protecting, like our AONBs and sensitive sites. We draw attention to NPPF 2021 Plan Making Number 315 to provide a platform for local people to shape their surroundings. So why do people choose to live in the tranquility of a village, far from the high life, bars and bistros, cafes, art galleries, theatres, concert halls and cinemas, far from sustainable public transport and hospitals? Is it because village life is a culture chosen for its simplicity, such as walking, gardening, and making our own entertainment. Churchill is a community with an individual identity. Residents ask us, what is the difference between those who have chosen to practice and live the way of life of a village and those who have chosen the doctrines of a particular religious way of life? Both the cultures should not both be equally respected I draw attention to NPPF 2021 8B, page 5. Like religious cultures, we know our neighbours and residents and perfectly demonstrated this during the pandemic, where we were able to quickly ensure that the needs of all vulnerable residents were met long before North Somerset or any government initiatives could be wheeled out. Sir Churchill is not NIMBY. Recently, we have had over 300 houses built in our village an increase of 35%. Churchill and Langford are two individual villages with separate identities, which together are one of the smallest service villages with the fewest amenities. We therefore draw your attention to North Somerset's core strategy CS14, referring to service villages, having opportunities for small scale development and draw your attention to the applications for 218 homes in four unplanned speculative development sites in the pipeline, of which this is one, all of which are on sites outside the village boundary, not on the, in the current or future local plans, and not on any site allocations plan. So not plan-led, and bringing the increase up to a possible 60%. I've put details in an appendix. I won't bother, bore you with them now. We further draw your attention to a recent request for engagement with Churchill Parish Council for a further 104 homes outside the settlement boundary, bringing an increase up to a massive 74% in the size of these two small villages. The new North Subset draft local plan in 2024 to 2038 has allocated a further 257 homes for which there are, some of which are on a brownfield site. We draw your attention to CS33 mentioned earlier, which we believe must apply to our village where Inspector Helen Skinner noted in her dismissal, inference can be drawn from the supporting text that unsustainable development is to be regarded as that which perpetuate commuting arising from dispersed patterns of growth. This seems to be particularly appropriate and that I've made a reference to that particular appeal. Taken together with 300 houses already built, the total potential increase in the size of our village is a staggering 91%. Sir, where will this stop? I refer you to the inspectors of the West of England Joint Spatial Plan who expressed uh, to the four unitary authorities on many occasions their concern about the promotion of remote strategic development locations of which Churchill was specified due to its unsustainability and unviability. 
and this was a principal reason for their rejection of the plan. Is Churchill to become an unplanned, remote strategic development location by stealth and wealth? Turning to the conservation area, we draw attention to the applications refused on appeal that were adjacent to the site in the conservation area and in the appendix to this, um, this document. There are important applications concerning land that, that sits in between the proposed site and Front Street. Churchill Parish Council further draws attention to the land that is not currently proposed for development, yet under the same cartilage. What hasn't been mentioned is the Grade II listed gates of Churchill Court, which are the finest example of hammer work in the West. We are reliably informed by a, a Bob Hobbs, who was a um, member of the uh, Master Blacksmiths Livery Company in London. The walls are separately listed they bound the unregistered park or garden of Churchill Court. Now, the historic hedge of the site proposed, um, and which added to, added to the views from, of those um, walkers coming from the village through to the church. But unfortunately, the appellant has let it grow, and despite the parish council having written to them, asking them to retain it as the historic hedge. So this has, has um, substantially um, removed views to, that, to this particular historic. The house next door to Churchill Court is also listed as a grade two. It was the old coach house of Churchill Court. And I think that is, that is important as it, it, it does um, create part of the setting of Churchill Court and, and the, the site in question. I move on to affordable housing. The application boasts affordable housing, but sir, these houses are not available to local people whose support network lies in the village. They are only available to those in need in Western Supermare or elsewhere, who on arrival in the village find that there are few shops and no cheap supermarkets, a poor bus service to employment centers, and the need for a car to travel to local amenities and their support network in Western. This cannot make sense in a world where we are desperate to reduce carbon emissions. Churchill Primary School has 30 places in reception. This year, 36 chose Churchill as their first choice. Four of those rejected have siblings in the school and have been offered places further afield, one as far away as Western Supermare. This is not surprising with the recent additional houses that we have um, accepted in the village and will no doubt continue. Church Academy is also full with children being offered places in schools outside of the village. GP access. Sir, to be certain of getting a GP appointment now means queuing outside the local surgery at 7.45 a.m. or earlier for the doors to open at 8 a.m. This is unacceptable for those with disabilities and the elderly. As a former nurse and latter, latterly an investigator of social care complaints, it is apparent that the impact on the NHS caused by late diagnoses and treatment on top of the impact on mental health for families is not nearly widely enough understood. The tentacles of bad planning reach far further than satisfying, satisfying housing targets. Churchill Sports Centre. <clears throat> the assumption that a greater volume of housing will make local facilities more viable appears not to be the case in terms of Churchill Sports Centre, which has remained closed since 2020. And Murphy's Fish and Chip Shop, which is due to close um, and become two residential properties. Another amenity lost. <coughs> Transport. Um, I, I refer you to Churchill Parish Council's response number 36 and NPPF 2021 number 9, 105 stroke 106, also noting that as a village, the majority of Front Street and all of Church Lane does not have pavements. I note you that you wish to concentrate on access. 
And thank you for um, <coughs> volunteering a site visit, excuse me, <coughs> to the school, <coughs> start and finishing times. But I do draw your attention to the fact that the sixth form are no longer in, and a lot of them are the ones that park the cars in Church Lane. And as the year progresses, we get so, and they pass their driving tests, so we get more and more cars coming down Church Lane. I also draw your attention to the fact that as the sports centre is closed, but is um, hopefully some point in the distant future going to open again, the school are currently using their car park um, for parking cars. But that is still not enough. Um, the half-term break also means that the sixth form <clears throat> um, effectively, uh, as I've just said, um, not there. At the start and finish of the day, it, it, it is wonderful that you're going to visit then, and uh, thank you for that. But I would also um, uh, draw your attention to the video that has been taken by local residents, um, which um, shows the congestion at the junction which um, Dr. Jacob was talking about. Um, it can take 20 minutes to get down from one end of Hilliers Lane to the other at school closing time. 20 minutes. And I've done that myself. Uh, we draw your attention also to the acknowledged large increase in traffic that will be generated by the forthcoming Banwell Bypass. It is further acknowledged that it will create rat runs, one of which will be Church Lane, Churchill Green and Front Street. Where Church Lane meets King Road, there is a very narrow S-bend. And I also draw your attention to the ancient single-track hollowways, which frame the entrance to this part of Churchill and the conservation area. They do need your um, uh, close look, look at that, please. Windmill Hill is one of the most loved and used open spaces for Churchill residents, particularly those who walk their dogs. It is much cherished for its tranquility and the views of the Mendip Hills AONB. Farmers who graze cattle on Windmill Hill have shared concerns that many more dogs will become, great, um, dropping their nice poo up there, it will become unsafe to graze cattle due to the disease toxicity of neosporosis, which is the most common cause of abortion in cattle. Need. We hope that we have amply demonstrated that there is no local need and that we, that we welcome plan-led, sustainable, zero-carbon development. New homes have not brought additional prosperity to our village, in fact the reverse. Churchill Memorial Hall is now too small for any village gathering. Public transport to local villages is not viable. The lanes are more congested and frustration, anger and resulting mental health, health issues are palpable. In his 2018 interview in number five previously I've mentioned, Professor um, Paul Cheshire referred to Greenbelt. He said, and I quote, we need only release a very small amount of Greenbelt land to solve the housing problem. If we don't, we will end up with a free for all that benefits no one. Green Belt has not been released, and four years on, it appears he was right. What we have got is bad planning on a, what appears to be an unstoppable scale, with its tentacles reaching into the heart of villages such as this old historic part of Churchill, with the relentless destruction of village culture and good quality agricultural land. We respectfully ask that these considerations are given the weight that we believe they truly deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Have you, have you got any questions? Just one question, sir, if that's all right. Yeah. It was just um, a comment made about the neighbourhood plan. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Was it said that the neighbourhood plan, um, the intention is to do nothing with that until such time as the council's emerging plan is adopted. That is correct. Thank you. Any more? No. Um, just, just from me, um, just to clarify, you mentioned the video. Um, 
I've not seen the video. Um, the guidance for inquiries doesn't allow the submission of, of videos. Um, so I've not, I've not seen it and nobody in the room have, have seen that video. It would have been explained by the case officer at the time that that would, was submitted. So what I will do, what I am going to do, I'm not withstanding your points about the, um, the sixth form um, being no longer in and the sports centre closed. I am going to visit on Thursday between the hours of, I think, um, eight and about quarter past nine in the morning. Would that seem? I avoid it. So, yeah. Sorry, I avoid, I avoid that time of going out yeah. at all. Yeah. But, but let me please assure you that in the normal, in the normal year, yeah. but obviously with the sixth mm. form not there, it's nothing like as bad. Um, the, the, the congestion there yeah. is phenomenal. Right, so and an emergency vehicle could not possibly yeah, well, get just, through. Just to clarify, is that time a reasonable time in the morning? I, I would think so. Yeah? Yes. And then in the afternoon, what, um, Sorry, I'm getting awful. say, quarter to, quarter to three? Um, oh. Yes. Yes, quarter to three. So the leader. Discussing that point with the witness, um, Mr. Kent uh, reminded me that we do have and frequently do use facilities for showing videos. Yeah. I appreciate that when it comes to taking away evidence, the video format is particularly unhelpful to you. Mm. But were you to want to view the video, that can be arranged quite conveniently. Yeah. Um, well, do could, you think the video will show us anything? Yes, I think it's vital actually because it 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 um, it, it will absolutely be clear what we're up against at oh. at that time. And it will save buses you. can't get round. It's have you have the appellant seen the video? No, I did mention the video in my case management conference note, so it shouldn't come as a surprise as as existing. Um, where, where, <laughs> who, who's got, has anybody got the video? Yes, so we, sir, we, we have somebody who's working the, uh, right. So what, what, what I don't want to do is, is show it before the appellants have had chance to, to see it. So. Yeah. Are you okay with that? How long is the video? Well, all right, so if everybody's happy, then should we just get on and show the video? Right. Um, just stay there for, for the moment. Could we not just turn the TV on? But anyway. Oh, I see. Yeah.
Is that is that the full video? Yep. I don't know. Yep. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. It certainly does um, demonstrate. That I've seen worse. I have to say. Yeah, okay. All right, so I've not got any further questions, but what, when I do visit on Thursday, I won't be meeting anyone and I won't be discussing the scheme with anyone. I will literally be viewing the site and its surroundings around those times. So please don't tell everybody to come out and say hello to me or meet me on site or because I will, I will be quite short with them and I won't be discussing anything to do with the, the, the proposal at all. All right. It's entirely a matter for you. I just wonder whether that has negated the need for you to do that. Because that would suggest you doing, having to do two sub site visits, both the main one and that morning one. If that was to show the conditions. Mm -hmm. I, I just wonder whether that saves you having to have a trip. No, I've, I've, I've said I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Very well, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, We'll go, we'll go straight on now, uh, moving on to, to hear the uh, appellant's ecology evidence. So, uh, Mr. Farmer, would you come take a seat? So if you're content, I'll introduce Mr. Farmer to the inquiry. Thank you. So your name is Dominic Farmer. You hold a first class degree in zoology from Nottingham University and an MSc in environmental conservation from the University of Greenwich. That's correct. And you were a chartered, uh, member of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management and registered as a chartered environmentalist with the Society for the Environment. That's right. Yes. So, um, uh, in terms of qualification and experience, I don't believe you've got that from Mr. Farmer, so we'll send a one-page uh, just so you've got that. But Very helpful. I'll, I'll take his um, qualifications as read when you see that note. Um, Mr. Farmer, I'd like you to talk the inspector briefly through the draft HOA, just highlighting what are the key points and underlining uh, the way in which you, you and I understand the council invite the inspector to conduct the appropriate assessment. Good afternoon, sir. Um, obviously, you've got this document in front of you, so I'll try and keep it fairly brief so I don't just go over too much old ground for you. Um, the purpose of the uh, HRA or the shadow HRA uh, was to basically take you through the, the legal tests associated with the conservation of habitats and species regulations, uh, in particular regulation 60, uh, under regulation 63, um, as you will now be taking on the role of the competent authority um, so um, effectively what we've tried to do is draw together all the information that you require to make that assessment. Um, so in, in the HRA, we've set out all of the legislation and the case law, um, and I don't propose to go through all of that because it's, it's there and taken as read. Um, although, just to summarize the tests, there's, there's effectively a two-step test, which is um, firstly, is there likely to be a significant effect on the nearby SAC? In this case, we're talking about the North Somerset and Mendip Bats SAC, Special Area of Conservation. Um, and the second test is, is there likely to be 
an adverse effect on the integrity of that SAC, either alone or in combination with other plans or projects. So that's effectively what we're trying to present evidence to address. Now, there is um, the North Somerset Amended BATS SAC uh, supplementary planning document, which draws together everything that is required to, to address the, the tests in habitat regulations, as they're commonly known. Um, and we've effectively put that together. That's core document B8, the, the SPD. Um, and the SAC here um, relates to two hibernation sites for bats, which are around uh, 2.8 uh, 2 kilometers southwest and 5.5 kilometers southwest of the appeal site. And there is also a maternity roost of lesser horseshoe bats uh, about two kilometers to the east, um, which wasn't noted in the uh, original SPD and came to light at a, a later date. So when we looked at the consultation zone plans within the SPD, the appeal site originally sits within what, what is called zone C, which doesn't require a whole season of surveys. It would just require uh, consideration of bats generally. But, but we, in consultation with the local authority, it came to light that it had been upgraded effectively to zone B, which did require a full season of surveys. And that's essentially what we have done and presented in our ecological assessment, which is the core document C7. Um, I, I won't go through all of the, the surveys in detail, um, but effectively what we did is we found that the key routes through the site for, for horseshoe bats, which are the SAC species, uh, was along the eastern and northern boundaries, um, with some use of the southern boundary as well. Um, and we have sought to, to engage with what the requirements for mitigating and keeping those routes for bats would be, because part of the test is that this land might be functionally linked to the SAC, so it's what the bats would require to fulfill their life cycle, and therefore the test is whether we would affect their ability to complete that and thus reduce numbers at the actual SAC by proposing this development. So that's, that's essentially what we've tried to look at. Um, and the SPD document helpfully gives you a calculation, an objective calculation that um, you, you put in your baseline habitats, you put in um, what, what you would like to create, which has to be replacement bat habitat that is suitable for horseshoe bats. And it tells you what requirement that hectareage would be on your site. Um, we did that in liaison with the uh, Somerset Council uh, ecologist who was actually the author of the SPD. So he helped us do those calculations to make sure that we were correct. And uh, effectively, we came out with a requirement for, I think it's 1.26 hectares of replacement bat habitat. Now, replacement bat habitat is, has got a very key meaning in that it needs to be uh, available to the bats, not just something that is provided that might be suitable. So for it to be available to bats, it needs to have relevant light levels, um, which is effectively no greater than 0.5 lux. Um, and it needs to have suitable habitats. Now that doesn't mean that we haven't provided extra habitat within that could be used by other bats that are less sensitive to light. So in this case, if you look at the SHRA, uh, we've provided a plan ECO 12 that shows you th what is the replacement bat habitat, i.e. That is, that is required for the horseshoe bats and other bat habitat that would be available, but where we don't feel that the light levels could be sufficiently controlled to be considered as habitat for the bats, and that's another half a hectare. So we've got 1.539 uh, hectares of replacement habitat and about 0.55 hectares of other habitat that could be used by bats. That's not to say that there won't be parts of that other habitat that will be dark enough to be used by horseshoe bats, but we're not reliant on that in terms of our mitigation and avoidance to make sure that we provide the certainty that we fulfill the tests in the regulations. Um, <coughs> so, in essence, our, our, our SHRA goes through 
all of the, the mitigation, so what would be within the replacement bat habitat, what is required, and it sets out where we feel that those items might need to be secured by condition to provide that certainty. So for example, management, uh, an LEMP, there's a condition in the draft conditions that requires that to be secured. That would also include monitoring to ensure that what is being proposed actually transpires on the ground and ways of dealing with that. For example, you'd monitor the light and check that the light is in fact at the levels that it's meant to be and if not, you'd have to seek to remediate that. So um, within the SHRA as well, as required by the SPD, we've got a specific lighting strategy, which is at um, the Annex 15, I believe. Sorry, just bear with me. Check on direct, yes, at Annex 15, there's a specific lighting strategy um, whilst there is no requirement for street lighting, there may be spillage from the internal areas of, of the houses uh, and exterior lighting associated, say, with garages, etc. So um, what that strategy sets out is how that lighting would need to be controlled. And we have assessed the replacement bat habitat in that context to ensure that we feel that 0.5 lux critical light level can be achieved in the replacement bat habitat. Um, so again, a detailed lighting strategy can only be done once you get to the detailed stage and you know the orientations of houses, where there's lighting, where there's going to be recessed lighting, that kind of thing is very detailed. That would again be secured by a condition, which I understand is in the draft conditions as well. Um, and we feel that once you take account of the mitigation that has been put forward for bats, which would include uh, woodland scrub planting, wildflower planting, um, wetland features, all of which are key for horseshoe bats, um, and maintaining these buffered areas, that we would maintain these uh, foraging and commuting areas. It's only the lesser horseshoes that are foraging on site, the greater horseshoes, there's no evidence they're actually foraging on the site but both species are using the site and we've uh, effectively put forward um, mitigation and suitable habitat for both species. Um, we feel that once that is in place, we will have met the tests so we won't be affecting their foraging or commuting routes through the site as we're keeping those key corridors and therefore we, we can meet the tests of the regulations. Now we. In, in the SHRA, we set out how we go through that integrity test and, and how Natural England has provided their own internal guidance, and that's set out in sections five and six of, of the HRA. Um, we have looked at in combination as well, although we feel that um, the adverse effects would be, in, in essence, nugatory. Um, we've looked at other developments that are either in planning at the current time and not determined, um, or an allocated site, for example. Um, and we've presented those on a plan so you can see where those developments are um, in, the, in the landscape scale of things, showing between the SAC. So you can see where the maternity roost is to the east, and you can see where the SAC hibernation sites are, and you can see everything in between on a landscape scale to show that what, what is proposed here in combination with those other developments would not affect the ability for bats to, to fly through the landscape. And just, uh, just to reiterate that each of those developments would also have to go through this HRA process in their own right alone. So they would have to be meeting everything on site themselves um, in the same way as we've, we have done on ours. So they would have to provide sufficient replacement bat habitat uh, in their own right. So not only can you see that there are alternative routes through the landscape around the developments, each of those developments, if used by bats, would maintain um, suitable foraging and commuting habitat for those species. And I think that's probably a fairly good summary, slightly longer than I anticipated. But. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <coughs> biodiversity net gain. Um, there's a metric that you've submitted uh, which gives the biodiversity net gain as 44.13, I believe. Yes. So just grab the 
relevant. Uh, 44.13, that's correct, yeah. Um, have you seen any competing biodiversity net gain calculations for the site? No, we ha I haven't seen anything that suggests that isn't correct. I know uh, we, we don't know at this point whether the council disputed, but uh, as we understand it, that there is no evidence before the inquiry that gives a different figure, is there? No. Thank you. Um, just in terms of calibrating that, uh, the Environment Act, when it gets around to it, will introduce a 10% threshold. 44, is that a significant uh, increase or is that modest or? It's, it's hugely above what will be expected. Um, and from my experience on other sites, it's not something you get every day. So. Thank you very much. Um, you obviously heard the evidence uh, today of Dr. Jaycock. Was there anything that he said that means that you've got to change any of your answers or anything that you want to specifically respond to? Uh, no, he, he references the horseshoe bats uh, being present on site. We don't contend that there, there are horseshoe bats on site. We just uh, suggest to you, sir, that we, we've dealt with them appropriately um, such that we meet the tests of the habitat regulations. And not only that for the horseshoe species, but the, the mitigation being put forward would also benefit other bat species as well. So it's not just restricted to those species. Um, in terms of the great crested newts, um, I wasn't sure why it was said that it wasn't noted at all. If you, if you go to section four of our ecological assessment, we, we do address um, great crested newts and we have looked at off-site ponds and done surveys of those. We, we, we weren't aware of a small ornamental pond in Dr. J. Cox garden. Um, I have looked at the uh, ecology report associated with that EN, eDNA test, um, it doesn't include how many, so, uh, not wanting to get too technical, you get replicates, number of replicates uh, associated with the, the eDNA of great crested newts, and it's out of 12. And say, if, you, if your test comes back with one out of 12, it's a very low, um, low EN, eDNA positive, and if you get 12 out of 12, it suggests higher numbers and therefore more DNA in the water. I can't tell you whether it was a low or a high test. Um, it is only a small ornamental pond of two, two meters by one meter. Um, I've not seen it other than in photographs that were in this report, but that the authors of that report suggested that the, if, if there were great crested newts present, they would only be in low numbers, and it would be unlikely that there would be uh, interchange between the newts in that pond and other ponds in the wider area given the distances between that pond and those other ponds being well over 250 metres. So, um, but, but just in terms of the appeal site itself, the, um, the, the large buffer areas, shall we call them, at the, at the edges of the site do provide significantly enhanced habitat for great crested newts um, post-development um, in terms of providing a, a wetland habitat that isn't currently even present. Um, and so that would go some way to, to providing further enhancements for that species if they are present um, in, in that pond. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I've got no further questions for you unless you've got any further observations for the inspector. Right, well, you might be asked some questions if you'll wait there, please. Okay, I've got a couple of, yeah, couple of questions. Um, can, you, can you just briefly explain um, the engagement with Natural England? and how that, how that works with the, the SPD, et cetera, that you've mentioned? Uh, Natural England have, have effectively endorsed the SPD um, approach. So therefore, normally the council would be the ones to go out to consultation with Natural England. Um, it would probably now fall to you if you felt you needed to take their view. My opinion is, is that we've followed the requirements of the SPD, they've endorsed that SPD, that it would be unlikely that they would disagree with the, the conclusions of that, of our SHRA. And in your opinion, what would the circumstances be that I would need to engage with Natural England? It's whether you felt you wanted to, to have their opinion on the SHRA. As I say, given we're, we're following the requirements of the SPD document that they've endorsed, 
I, I wouldn't, in my opinion, see that to be necessary. But, but obviously, so that's for you to de decide yourself. Thank you. Um, just questions about the uh, mitigation. Um, so, really, in summary, that it's quite set out quite detailed in the shadow HRA what the mitigation is. Um, you referred to the relevant plans, ECO 12, and specifically a hectareage of, of habitat space. Um, the conditions are quite uh, general in that, in that they require pretty much plans and further strategies to be submitted. Um, I've got a slight concern as to whether um, they're sufficient to secure the detailed mitigation that's been already specified? If necessary, I, I, the, the conditions could be reworded to, to effectively draw, uh, have regard to the principles set out in the SHRA and build upon those to provide mm -hmm. the necessary detail at that stage. Yeah. That might be one way of, of ensuring that everything that's in there does come forward at the yeah. detailed stage. Okay. So I think probably bear that in mind for now and we'll probably come back to that at the round table discussion. Um, also similar thoughts along the lines of the uh, planning obligations as well. You mentioned, um, you mentioned maintenance, um, specifically relating to the bat habitat and obviously survey work. Yeah. Um, again, is that something that, that ought to be set out in the uh, planning obligation? It, 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 we can include those sort of measures in, in our environmental management plans, which, whichever document, you, or you could secure it via a totally separate um, condition. Uh, mm. it, it's, it's up to you, sir, which, okay. which method you would see fit. Yeah. Um, as I say, they're, they're all set out in detail, so if, 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 it, if the conditions uh, draw us back to that document and require us to... to include those measures and build upon those, then that, that mm. should include all of the okay. necessary requirements. Okay. So, again, we can pick that up at the round table session on the, on the obligation, but I say I've got a little niggling concern in my mind in, in that I think the mitigation is quite detailed in the shadow, shadow uh, HRA. Um, I suppose if I were minded to grant approval and you know needing to undertake the appropriate assessment, I need to be clear in my own mind as to exactly what that mitigation was and confident that it would be secured. So may I just address you briefly on um, biodiversity net gain? If, if it's convenient to do so now, it may be. Yeah, I'll just draw a line under that discussion. So just. If that, that concern there, I probably can't really push it much further now, but I think my initial feeling, and I'll, and I'll reflect and consider, is I think the conditions need to capture more detail, and I also suggest that the subject to what those conditions say, you may need to, to put a bit more detail in the uh, obligation as well. But I've not formed a clear view on that at the moment, but I'm, I'm flagging it for the discussion that we will have next week. Can I just briefly address you on that before? Because yeah. I think yeah. we're moving on to a different point. Yeah, I believe if, that's, if that's okay, yeah. Um, so my understanding is for the purpose of the appropriate assessment, you just have to be satisfied that with mitigation, it will not adversely affect the integrity of the habitat site. I don't think you've got to secure the mitigation now because obviously if we have a condition which is mm. required mm. that there be a mitigation plan mm. without specifying what that is the HRA just demonstrates here's one example of mitigation that could come forward that would ensure that you don't have it affect the integrity of the habitat site but it, that doesn't need to be the specific one so it could just be a, a more broad condition mm. which ensures that that information is provided to the local plan authority probably at the reserve matter stage or thereabouts. So I, we can do it where we fix ourselves and wed ourselves to the current mitigation, but we equally we can say, well, that's just illustrative. Mm. 
and we can have a much more broad condition. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know which way okay. you, you want to go on that, sir. All right. I'll bear that in mind. Thank you. I agree with that. The Abbott's Kirkwood case makes that com makes it amply clear. You don't need to fix the mitigation now. You do need to be satisfied it can be achieved. Yeah. Okay, thank you. On biodiversity net gain, may I just speak to you briefly yeah. about that, sir? So when the appeal was lodged and when the council drafted its putative reason for refusal, um, the ecological evidence available to it was that contained at core document CDC7, which is a weighty tome headed ecological assessment. Now, subsequently, the appellants produced their pre-inquiry statement of case, and that is core document CDD1. And at pages 13 to 14 of that document, the appellant set out, or rather in accordance with the inquiry's procedure rules, they should have set out with precision those matters that they wish to advance in support of their case, including, amongst other things, matters to be put in the planning balance in favour of the appeal. Now, you can read the document in your own time, but one of the things you will notice is that nowhere within the pre-inquiry statement of case is it suggested that biodiversity net gain is to be placed in the balance in favour of the proposal. Now, be that as it may, I am instructed that on or around the 25th of May, the appellants then submitted uh, their calculations of biodiversity net gain. Now, it may or may not be the case that they are controversial because, to be frank with you, the council's ecologist, has, who's a part-time ecologist, has been unable to review those matters in the time available to us. We don't want to be unhelpful about this. We don't want to make contentious that which is not contentious. But certain observations were made as to whether or not BNG is agreed. Well, it may be. It isn't at the moment. And to the extent it is agreed there is BNG, what I can't do is warrant we will agree completely with the evidence of Mr. Farmer. But I just wanted to put down a marker that um, Mr. Farmer is an impressive witness. It may well be we can agree BNG. But as, as of today, we're a bit wrong-footed. We're not complaining. We're just saying that we don't feel yet that we're able to assist with that agreement or not and we would like the facility if need be to question Mr Farmer again in due course having regard to the time at which his evidence on BNG was received and our inability to deal with it adequately before today. I say that now sir we don't perhaps need to debate it any further I could discuss this matter with my learned friend and we'll try and agree it if we can. Okay. I'm not sure what to respond to, sir, because obviously the council said they'll come back to us on what their position is, so it's premature for me to say anything because they might come back and say it's agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it, it, it would be helpful to me if, if you could agree common ground. Um, you know, again, <laughs> not straying into five-year supply territory, that common ground could even, if you can't agree, it could well be in, in a range, um, but, but still. Uh, whatever you can agree would be helpful to me. Yes. So the, the, the object was, as I say, to put down a marker that we'll do our best, but it may be we end up arguing about matters. I, I would hope not, though. Okay. Right, I'm, I've not got any more questions for, for, for you, Mr. Farmer. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the interested parties? Um, Ms., Ms. Murray. Um, yes, please. Um, please, can you tell, tell us how, um, how bat corridors and mitigation for bats and newts would be uh, monitored and who will pay for it once the developers move out? And whose responsibility is it? Um, is it the, the, environment, uh, the local authority enforcement team, which is absolutely pulled in every direction at the moment? or is it the responsibility of the developer or the individual homeowners, once they've bought their house, will they realize that that's the case? Uh, it's likely that the um, conditions that are attached to a, a consent, if it were, were granted, 
would include um, a requirement to identify those who were responsible um, for implementing the various measures within the management plan, the monitoring, etc. That would all, all form part of, of that um, element of, of detail. Um, in terms of if there's funding required, I assume that may be via uh, a planning obligation, but, but again, I can't comment at this stage. Mr. Jay Cup, do you have a question? Could, yes. Um, I, I wonder, Dr. Mr. Farmer, if, if I could ask you uh, one very specific question. Um, you, you assert there's no evidence um, on the part of greater horseshoe bats um, of their foraging on this site. What is that evidence? There's, without getting too technical, there is something called Miller's Index, which is effectively uh, where you look at, um, I, in fact, I can probably read you something from, from the SPD document, which may help, um, rather than paraphrase. Effectively, Miller's Activity Index, sorry, this is, this is actually in the, the Mendip District Council uh, SAC supplementary planning document because the, the, the Miller's Activity isn't mentioned um, in, in the uh, North Somerset SPD, but it, it is by the same author and is effectively an update to that document. Um, if, you, if you were to look at uh, section A5.31, sir, um, Miller's activity index is call sequences with a negative minute on either side, i.e. a minute in which a species was not recorded, are judged to be com commuting contacts, whereas contacts in two consecutive minutes or more are judged to be foraging contacts. Foraging is defined as six or more such minutes over any three nights in the five nights of any one automated detector during the recording period. So effectively, what you do is you look at the timings of all the calls, and if you, if you, if you meet those specific set of circumstances, you would be judged as having a bat that was foraging on the site. And if you don't, it's judged to only be commuting. Um, we provided the data to the county ecologist, Larry Burroughs, who again is the author of these documents, and he was the one who did the assessment, and he was the one who came back based on the Miller's Index to say that uh, there were lesser horseshoes commuting and foraging, and greater horseshoes only commuting. Can, can I return to that? Um, it, it so happens, that, uh, as you know, that I have monitored um, acoustically as well as watching bats. Um, so I have actually got observations where, which are definitely um, greater horseshoe bat observations and I can match those with acoustic recordings of the same animal. Um, and I, I can tell you that um, the behavior of the bat and the consequences of its uh, activity were firstly that we don't meet the Miller index, but secondly that the bat was successfully foraging. I mean, I saw it take a May bug and fail and then take another one and succeed. Um, and so at least anecdotally, um, I would suggest that we have here a possible conflict. Okay. So, if you, thank you for that. Uh, I've got to keep it to questions. Um, but is there any more questions that you've got for Mr. Farmer? Well, well if I might add another one, I, I'm also conscious of the passage of time, but. Um, might I add the fo ask the following question? Um, what statutory procedures are there for controlling light intensity 
on a housing estate. So that, that would come again under what, what mechanism is used to secure the lighting strategy. Um, so I, I, don't, I can't comment on that at the, at the current time. Um, there, there are often used covenants uh, to prevent additional lighting to be added to, um, to properties on the exterior in circumstances such as this. And it's often the case that, that the lighting strategy at the detailed stage will actually include lighting so that new residents wouldn't put it up in an inappropriate area. So you would, you would be addressing that point to provide the necessary lighting in a, in a sympathetic manner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I've got no further questions. But thank you. Uh, is there anybody else? No. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, next item on the programme is the council's landscape evidence. I don't propose to to start that now so um has anybody got anything else they want to say before i adjourn for lunch briefly sir if that's okay the the first point is the doc documents the council has to be put in this morning is a little bit further along the comparison of the land supply positions um my witness looked at it and uh, as i understand it there were some errors in it they've been corrected and it's been agreed between the two parties so that we can put that before you if, if you don't assist her. Um, and then this document, um, this is a document we hadn't seen. As, as we understand it, it's not a document in the public domain. We still can't find it right now. So as, uh, it's been referenced, but the documents never isn't out there. And this is the first time it will be put out in the public domain as we understand it. Um, I'll come back to you after lunch as to whether we're going to object to it going in. If we can deal with it, we will, but I just haven't gone through with it with Mr. Cook. Also, may I respond in this way? The document is referenced in Mr. Etchells' evidence, and Mr. Etchells makes various observations about what is in it. So it would seem to me, sir, that two things are true. The first is that the appellant has been on notice of it for several weeks. Secondly, he would have known its material. This is Mr. Cook. And thirdly, knowing about it, knowing its material, he had the opportunity to ask for it and would have been supplied with it because plainly the council's got a copy of it if nobody else has, first point. Second point is you are likely to be assisted by having in front of you that which is referred to in Mr. Eshwell's evidence. Third point is that actually and this is something both parties need to think about, perhaps, it being clear that this was a document that was going to be before the inquiry, like many others, it ought to have been a core document, and my application would be to make it a core document. Mr. Cook does not give evidence, it would appear on the current timetable, until at least tomorrow afternoon. Um, he's got plenty of time to read it. Uh, it is, frankly, uh, surprising to think that this is even going to be slightly contentious. But, but I make it clear now that I intend to take Mr. Etchell's to it. My learned friend, if he wishes to object, can give us reasons for doing so. But I have to say that the, his witness, having had notice of this for at least four weeks, probably could have asked for it before now. Mm -hmm. So I make that position very... I, I'm, I'm being quite firm, sir, because actually mm -hmm. it really doesn't wash to say we are taken by surprise. They could not have read Mr. Rettles' proof then, if they are. Well, I don't think anybody said that then it's, it's not, they, they're going to object to it being submitted. And I think the view is we're going to, they're going to consider it and we'll come back after lunch and we'll, we'll take it from there. Great, sir. Okay. Um, so that document on um, the land supply then, so is there a corrected version that... Thank you. Give that to me after lunch? Yeah. Yep. The correct is perhaps a little harsh. What happened was this. The actual figures from the actual proofs were incorporated into the table. After mm -hmm. each proof had been prepared, there was some 
affordability index is published, which calls the bottom lines to be amended. So what you're going to get is a table with the bottom line as recorded in the document as it was going to be handed in, then the current bottom line. It's not yeah. an error, it's exactly. an update. Yeah. Okay. Uh, apologies for my language there. It wasn't meant to be... Uh, it wasn't meant to be firming any clear views on the on the evidence so, um, so I, I don't know what's gone on with the document because I've been listening to the evidence mm -hmm. and we we're getting a new all, version. All, I, all I'm interested in is am I am I getting it and okay so I'll get that after lunch thank you um, anything else okay all right then so just before one um, we'll adjourn the inquiry and we'll come back at, at two. Thank you.